let's get into our first story of today. Uh, let's talk about Fred Hampton. And we we now have some revelations uh, about how uh, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, at that time, was directly involved with uh, Hampton's assassination. Now, if you guys don't know, I, I did one of the earliest like virtual shows that I did was all about the Black Panthers, the history of the Black Panthers, their um, you know very antagonistic relationship with the cops because cops were attacking uh, the black community and they figured they wanted to do something. So they the first thing they invented was cop watch uh, invented. The first thing they organized was a cop watch. Um, and then that led to gun control regulations from the Republicans, right? It 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 it, it put uh, Black Panthers in prison. That there are still pan Panthers in prison today that are considered political prisoners because the way that they would be able to get out of prison is by um, denouncing the fact that they're Black Panthers, right? So that's the way that they would get out of prison, which is bullshit. So they're they're political prisoners. And one of the uh, biggest things uh, uh, as part of the Panther history is the assassination of one Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was a 21-year-old uh, organizer within the Black Panther Party, and he rose to the ranks and became a leader in the Chicago uh, chapter of the Black Panthers, and he was this one, excellent, wonderful orator. Right At 21 years old, he's, he's leading and organizing uh, a, a, a one of the largest Black Panther Party uh, chapters in the country, right? And like, like I can't say that for myself at 21. Like at 21, I just figured out how to bong a beer without crying. Like that was my big crowning achievement. It's like, look, I I didn't cry this time. Uh, you know, this guy is like bridging uh, racial and ideological gaps. And that's primarily what he was doing. Right. That's that's primarily why he became such a big threat to law enforcement, uh, to the FBI, to, uh, you know, the um, uh, the the establishment in general. So um, the FBI often used informants. They often had uh, informants uh, within the um, within the Black Panther Party. That was that was one of the things that led to uh them dissolving in the 80s right they had like a 20 year uh 20 some odd year run um of organizing uh community programs stuff that without the panthers wouldn't exist today like school lunches wouldn't exist without the panthers today uh the panthers uh were one of the only organizations looking for sickle cell anemia and trying to treat that within the black community which led to a larger uh, again like a big federal funding for um, sickle cell anemia that was not going to happen under the Nixon administration because Nixon was a racist and could give sh two shits less about them uh, about communities of color, right? And uh, all the so the FBI basically targeted them because they were running uh, ground level social programs. They were using socialism as a platform to help people within their community, help p communities of color. And then they were teaching other communities of color how they can do this everywhere so that they're not the only ones doing it in, you know, Oakland, California or San Francisco, California. So uh, Fred Hampton, one of the things that he was uh, well known for is he went to the Latino community, to the poor white neighborhoods, to the Asian communities. And he would talk to them about Panther ideology. And he would say, this is how we helped and uplifted our community. This is our survival programs. This is how we gave health care to, to un, you know, low income underfunded communities. And, you know, if you if, if we can work together, we can teach you how to do this in your communities. And instead of being stuck in poverty because the government's not helping us, the government's more in, in, interested in this Vietnam War. They're more interested in 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 uh, corporate welfare. And so, you know, groups that would never really talk to each other because of manufactured divide uh, from the establishment, from groups like the FBI, they started talking to each other. The show I did has, uh, you know, some video clips of um uh of what they call Appalachian white boys right uh these sort of you know these App these Appalachian folks that wouldn't normally talk to someone like Fred Hampton from the Black Panther Party wouldn't really look I mean in, in today's terms that's what we look at right we we look at anybody with with a little bit of a twang in their voice to be one of them racists holding up the Confederate flag 
talk about heritage. That's what we assume when we hear that sort of shit. But Fred Hampton knew that's not what they said. Fred Hampton understood that the plight of the poor white community, the plight of the Latino community, the plight of the Asian community was all virtually the same as the plight of the black community in America. And there's a clip of them saying, you know, I think if we line up with the Panthers, uh, we can help them out with some of our resources. And I know that they're going to help us out with some of theirs. And so Fred Hampton became dangerous. Now, J. Edgar Hoover, who is the director of the FBI, uh, was a vicious racist. Um, in several uh, several documents that were floated around the FBI, this guy would talk about, you know, the rise of the black messiah. That's what he was scared of the most. Uh, he thought King was the black messiah for a while. Uh, despite his popularity at the time, like MLK was was rather unpopular at the time, uh, especially with white liberals. Uh, moderate white liberals didn't care for him because he was talking about empowering uh, people from a different social class. And they didn't want that because then, you know, oh, man, if these people get if these people rise up, then we're, we're not going to have the same social status we are. And, and again, we still see that sort of stuff today. So Hoover thought MLK was the black messiah for a while, went after him. We and we know that we, we you know that uh, they used the uh, they found out they they spied on him they tapped his phones and they would track his hotels and shit like that and they found out that he was uh, having affairs and then they said that they were going to use his his affair as a weapon against him. They did that with the Panthers as well. Uh, he thought Bobby Seale was that because of his survival programs that were spreading across the country. Um, and, uh, they, they, they got him arrested and they thought that would collapse the Panther party, but it didn't. Um, and then they went after Fred Hampton. Um, and at this point, what they were doing was they were using, uh, informants within the black Panther party. Um, and the way that they were doing that is they would take these people that had, you know, um, a minor burglary charge, uh, you know, a uh, some kind of a parole violation, maybe. And they were saying, well, if you don't want this to get worse, we can expunge your record as long as you work for the FBI. Go join the Black Panthers. Go report back to us what they're doing. Give us the layouts of their Panther pads. Give us, uh, you know, information about where they're meeting, who they're meeting, who some of their associates are, this, that, and the third. They basically blackmailed uh, people in, in communities of color saying that they were going to make their criminal charges worse uh, because that's the only way that they could infiltrate the Panthers and take them down from the inside. At that, I mean, public opinion was shifting. How could you, how could you have a bad public opinion of a group that uh, wants to feed children, uh, wants to take the elderly to the hospital without charging them an arm and a leg wants to get people health care, wants to help people with sickle cell anemia, which was at that point a disease that, you know, wasn't getting enough attention that was pr primarily, uh, you know, a, a problem for communities of color. How could you, how could anybody be against something like that? Well, you manufacture that they're terrorists. Oh, they have guns. Well, yeah, of course they have guns. They're being, they're literally being gunned down in the streets by the cops. So these new documents now reveal that J. Edgar Hoover was actually closely involved um, with the assassination of Fred Hampton. Uh, there was an informant that gave out the layout uh, of, of Hampton's uh, Panther pad. There was another Panther leader that was there with Fred uh, in a Chicago Panther pad. Right. And um, basically like, J. Edgar Hoover was was keeping an eye on all of this stuff. Uh, this wasn't like, oh, the Chicago FBI, you know, executed this raid where they worked with the Chicago Police Department. No, J. Edgar Hoover was involved. The director of the FBI was involved with this. He knew about the informants. He knew about the plans. And he was the one that said, yeah, go do this. Kill this guy. Get rid of him. He's too dangerous because he's crossing 
uh, class line and racial lines. He to to J. Edgar Hoover, Fred Hampton was the black messiah that he was looking for. So they knew about this. They go in. They oh they you know they they claim they tell the Chicago Police Department oh there's guns they've they've got illegal guns and and they're running guns out of this Panther pad. You guys got to go in and and get rid of them. And so they did. They went in and they raided the Panther pad when when they were asleep. Uh, the I think the FBI informant let them in. I think that's the detail. Um, they went in and they shot the place up. And they fucking killed everybody in there. Uh, that might be a little mild exaggeration. They might have not killed everybody. There might have been like one or two people still left alive. But Fred Hampton was murdered in his sleep. He was assassinated by the Chicago Police Department in conjunction with the FBI. Um, there was another Panther leader that was also killed at this point. Uh, and they left the house open because the Chicago police department was cocky to, to think that they did a good job, uh, but they had falsified evidence and they just committed murder, like mass murder, mass murder. So following this, there was an investigation that happened, right? And there was a grand jury and uh, based on what happened with Breonna Taylor, we all know how great grand juries are. Uh, and the FBI agents that, the, like the specific ones that were involved the, the, from the Chicago FBI, they were told that if they, uh, if they were questioned by the grand jury about how they got the information about the FBI's particular involvement um, of the assassination of Fred Hampton, that they're supposed to stay silent and then report that question back to the director of the FBI. So the director of the FBI knows that the grand jury is is talking to, to uh, you know, FBI agents about this and questioning them about this shit. So they were told to be quiet about it. So they were trying to hide all that under the rug. They were they were trying to they were trying to erase evidence that the FBI was ever involved with the raid of Fred Fred Hampton's uh, Panzer Bad. They were allowed to talk about who fired the guns, right? Like who was involved in the raid, which cops were involved in the raid uh, under the direction of the FBI. But they weren't supposed to talk about the floor plans or how they got the floor plans or who let them into the apartment. All these details they were not allowed to talk to the grand jury about, even if they were questioned about it. So very sneaky, sh shady shit, you know. And this is the group that, of course, it's like the FBI is upheld in this um, glorious light of, of sorts. Now, internally... They were they were excited because they finally succeeded, right? To Jay to J. Edgar Hoover, he had just killed the Black Messiah, hence just ending the Black Panther Party right then and there. Then they got judges to block the evidence that uh, that the FBI was even involved, right? Um, so I'll pull up the clip here so you guys can hear it. Uh, this is from Democracy Now!, which I've had my issues with Democracy Now!, um, I think a lot of a lot of people have had issues with Democracy Now!, uh, but they, I, I do I do like some of the stuff that they cover, and then I'm very, I'm critical of some of the other stuff that they cover. So this came out yesterday, uh, and you know even Aaron Mate has criticized Democracy Now!, and Amy Goodman, uh, and and her going down the Russia Gate and the Trump derangement syndrome stuff when when they didn't do that before. But uh, this is this is a pretty informative piece here. So I'm going to play this clip. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear it. If you guys can't hear it, uh, uh, you know, like leave a comment. Well, this was a trial eight, 18 months uh, on trial, Jeff and I and others in our office. 
uh, fighting to get these documents out, fighting to establish the role of the FBI. And we had a judge who was very similar to Judge um, Hoffman in the Conspiracy 8 trial, which many people may remember. Uh, and he was dead set against us. He was originally from Alabama. He was a racist. Uh, and he did not believe and would not let us get at the evidence uh, that the FBI was involved in this case. But we were developing this evidence along with the Senate Select Committee, the Church Committee. So we were exposing this evidence both in court and outside of court, and the judge was getting more and more upset with us. And so when we protested uh, the unfair rulings that he was making, he was keeping us from putting Hoover in the case. He was keeping us from putting uh, John Mitchell and uh, the others from Washington in the case. And he was um, uh, keeping us from getting the documents that showed the bonus to O'Neill, the informant, uh, all of this we were fighting for day and day after day. And when we protested, both of us at various times were held in contempt and sent to the federal uh, lockup here in Chicago. But we kept fighting it. Uh, the judge threw the case out after 18 months of trial, believe it or not. He wouldn't let the jury decide the case. We fought to, uh, it to appeal, and we won uh, a remarkable decision in the Court of Appeals, uh, defended it in the U.S. Supreme Court, and 13 years of, of litigation and fighting uh, to get the evidence out, uh, we were ultimately able to, to uh, obtain one of the largest, if not the largest, police violence settlement for the families of Mark Clark and Fred Hampton and the surviving uh, Panthers uh, in the history at that time of, of the federal courts. So there you go. 13 years to get um, to get justice. I mean, the judge was even blocking the evidence. Like they, they were just like, we, uh, we don't want to see the evidence. Don't bring legitimate evidence to say that the FBI was involved in this shit. I, we don't want that shit. Get the fuck out of here. Eventually, they threw the case out, and then 13 years later, they get a settlement. 13 years to get a settlement for a bunch of Black Panthers that were murdered by the Chicago Police Department in conjunction with the FBI. 13 years to get that settlement. But how quickly do killer cops get away with murder? I mean, in less than a year, the, the grand jury for Breonna Taylor was like, oh, he shot a door, so maybe he'll face three to five for that shit. You know? A cop stands on a man's neck for eight minutes and 46, uh, 46 seconds, and they're trying to get him a lesser sentence than second-degree murder. Where they're like, oh, well, maybe he shouldn't go to jail for too long. Right? Like, Daniel Pantaleo, the uh, uh, officer that choked out Eric Garner, is not getting any sort of criminal charges against him for killing a man. These cases where these killer cops get let go, you know, barely a blink of an eye before they're just let go, and the, and the judges go, well... I don't know. Maybe there's evidence. Maybe there isn't. Who knows? Let's send them back to work. It took 13 years to finally get uh, some sort of financial restitution for the murder of Fred Hampton and a bunch of Black Panthers. And now we're looking at grand juries and the judicial system that just lets these people go. We have had we we are now regressing as as uh, in terms of um, our judicial system. Like our judicial system is a regressive system that stands by more injustices than it does the other side of it. And I hate to say this, but the the only times that they do take a a moral stance on anything dealing with social justice is when it needs to be a distraction, right? So they'll 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 grant uh, they'll decide that oh you can't fire anybody for their sexual orientation um and and representing who they are. That 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 is something the Supreme Court will decide and at the same time they'll say, "Oh, we're not looking at qualified immunity cases." 
anything that we decided in terms of qualified immunity is going to stick and we're going to keep qualified immunity in place to protect the cops. Those decisions happen side by side. What ends up happening is corporate media will pick up the the story about the LGBTQ community. And I'm not saying that the LGBTQ community should not be just they, they should absolutely not be fired for who they are. That's ridiculous. But don't use the LG, our, our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters as some sort of distraction to continue killing people of color on the streets and, and excuse those cops that murder people of color on our streets. Don't do that. And that's what the judicial system does. This, I mean, this is a regressive system. And this is being, and time and time again, people are proving it. Now, the, I'm going to, I'm going to get the second clip ready to go. Um, the Panthers actually had, uh, like 25% of the black community across the country were pro Panthers. Outside the black Panthers, obviously, right? Like I'm, I'm sure some people are just like, oh, well, of course they're pro, but they were all black Panthers. No, this is 25% outside the Black Panthers uh, of the black community was pro-Black Panthers. Why? Because of their survival programs, because they helped the community, because they fed kids, because they were helping sick people, because they were helping people not be homeless. You know, shit that a government is supposed to help doing. These people on the grounds organizing together and then teaching other communities how to do the same thing. They built a template and then spread it across the country so that communities could learn how to take care of each other and then maybe build off of that and maybe improve the system and then share that with these other communities and just make a better system for everybody to enjoy so that everybody has a leg up in our community so that everybody can, can get the basic needs met so that they can all be successful and thrive so that they all can get the American dream rather than it being, you know, who's willing to be cutthroat, who's willing to uh, step on the throats of their neighbors. That's what the Panthers were doing. And that's why the Panthers were attacked. Their, their socialist survival programs was why people liked them. They also had a newspaper that, th that they talked about a bunch of shit that corporate media wouldn't cover about the black community about a bunch of atrocities that were going on, about a bunch of uh, class war bullshit. And they got the information out to their people. They sold it for uh, like a quarter, I think. Um, that's also where uh, Cops or Pigs comes from, right? They they drew the Cops as Pigs in one of their little comic books, and, that's, and that caught on, and that's why Cops are called Pigs. Like, that's the origination of that. So they did all these things to help the people while there was a, you know, th this was the beginnings of the neoliberal corporatist government that didn't give a shit about the people. That was allowing the African-American communities across the country to be gunned down by cops. So let's, this is the, this is the last little piece here. Let's listen to uh, Flint one more time. Significant, and its leadership was as well. And Fred Hampton was a, not only an up and coming leader, but a, a very charismatic and dynamic leader. And the Panthers uh, had a 10 point program. That program uh, covered the waterfront uh, with, with all sorts of revolutionary and socialistic programs. Uh, free breakfast program, for example, a uh, free medical clinic, for another example, a newspaper that came out every week and talked about the atrocities of, uh, of the police and, and, and the government. It was very much an anti-imperialist organization, uh, fought against the war in Vietnam, said people should not go to Vietnam, uh, opposed mass incarceration before there actually was that term. Uh, and uh, also was very strong in setting up and fighting for coalitions between black, uh, Hispanic, or, or uh, like the Young Lords, of course, you know about that, Warren, Juan, and other organizations, uh, revolutionary and radical organizations. And this is another reason why Hoover feared 
uh, the Panthers so much because they were bringing together all sorts of different radical and revolutionary groups, war, uh, groups against the war in Vietnam. Uh, and this was very threatening to the government at that time. And they targeted under the COINTELPRO program, which was focused to destroy the Black Panther Party uh, on Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers because they were so successful here in Chicago. So there you go. What they really feared was the unity uh, between all of these different groups. They were scared that if these groups come together, that they will build a better system, that something like the FBI would lose its power. Rich politicians up at the top that are connected to, uh, to crony capitalists would lose their positions of power and would lose their incredible over-the-top wealth. That's what they're really afraid of. And we see smears like this all the time, right? I've, I've gotten, I mean, I have friends that desperately try to convince me never to talk to anybody that's a conservative or a libertarian or so on and so forth. But, you know, I, I've mentioned this several times when I got when I was on the road and touring around the people that were always curious enough to come and talk to me were the conservatives that stuck around to the end of the show. And they said, we agree with almost everything you had to say. There's a couple things that, you know, that, that we probably don't agree on. And that's fine. You know who attacks me the most online? It's not conservatives. It's not Trump supporters. Even when I say some shit about Trump or conservatives, it's liberals. It's these it's these people that talk about, uh, you know, empathy and understanding. They're the ones that are co contributing to the divide. They're the ones that would look at somebody like Fred Hampton. And they would say, oh, that's ridiculous. Why is he going to Appalachia to talk to those redneck hicks? That's fucking bullshit. He should not be doing that. No, we should be doing that. I mean, we just saw Jimmy Dore get a bunch of shit. Recently. And I watched that interview, and I would guarantee that most of the people that are chastising Jimmy Dore for having uh, the the uh, the libertarian anarchist boogaloo boy on 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 their on his channel um, have not watched the fucking video. The dude is the dude talks about a bunch of lefty topics, pro LGBTQ. He's pro gun. Yeah, it makes sense for someone like you know that that's a little bit on the anarchist side. Pro working class believes in direct action. I mean, these are not right wing ideologies. These are not far right populist ideologies. Those aren't Trump ideologies. And Fred Hampton, and this is what they do when you talk about unity, when you talk about bringing people together, is now what they well, they'll digitally throttle you, and they'll and they'll get their you know the the mobs that only pay attention to CNN or MSNBC or Fox News and all that, and they'll and they'll kind of send them after you to like attack you in some way, shape, or form, and that's what happens because they can't outright assassinate anybody. Uh, without it sparking this major controversy anymore. I mean, as much as... As much as internally the FBI was talking about this being a success, after 13 years, they lost a couple million dollars in terms of settlements. So financially speaking, it wasn't, it wasn't a success for them. It was a success in terms of it stopped the Chicago Black Panther Party chapter because you murdered all of them. But the legacy of the Panthers continued, right? The way so then what they did is they co-opted. They they do what exactly what happened uh with people that talk about, you know, unity, like true unity, like people that are like, okay, we should talk to conservatives, we should talk to these farmers, we should talk to these tradespeople, and we should we should express to them that we're not their enemy, that we probably have a lot more in common. We're talking about how to execute ideas, how to execute plans, you know, but for the most part, we believe in the same things. But they don't know that we believe in the same things because the media is being used, corporate media specifically is being used as a way to divide us. And when you say that, corporate media comes out. They use their corporate media propaganda tactics 
to to smear the message. Oh, this guy's bringing, oh, he's supporting racists. He's platforming racists. Well, that's not true at all. Jimmy Dore wasn't platforming racists, and neither was Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was trying to bring the entire working class together, and he was trying to look beyond just race. And they killed him for it. That's what happens when you talk about real unity. They will kill you for it. Or they will smear you to the point where, you know, they try to make you a farce. If you really listen to what these people have to say, I mean, if you want to prevent another Trump from coming around, then you need to be able to listen to people on the opposite side. And I know what the extreme example is. Oh, the KKK or, oh, these people that believe in the extermination of, yes, those people do exist. I'm not denying that. And those people are going to be a lot harder to talk to. But your average working class person that doesn't understand why the minimum wage should be up, why healthcare is a human right, why we need a UBI during a pandemic. Well, that person probably believes in those things, but is being told not to by, you know, corporate media. And if we talk to them, they'll go, yeah, you know what? That is a good idea. I guess there are some kinks that need to be worked out, but overall, it seems like it's a good idea for the people. And then who do they who do they stop backing? Corporate media, corporate politicians. Uh, intelligence agencies like the FBI and the CIA, they stop trusting them. That's scary for them. All right. Uh, let's look at a few comments before we move to the to, to the next two topics. Todd, thanks for tuning in. Uh, there's a certain kind of person that loves their racism hidden behind a smile. Yeah, and I've, and I've seen that several times, uh, it, it, what you're talking about, where people will come up to see my shows, and I'm this you know brown immigrant comic that talks about sociopolitical issues, and these liberals that listen to NPR will come and they'll watch my show, and you know, some of them will, you know, obviously hang out and um, talk to me, but uh, some of them will, will smile and say, hey, I would have loved it if you did the accent. I was really looking forward to listening to that accent tonight. Uh, and, you know, I stopped doing that because of comments like that, because once I heard those comments from even the most liberal of people. I realized that what they were laughing at was not what I had written but the accent, that's what's funny to them. It's the way that, oh, aren't foreigners goofy sounding? Oh, harmless. And that's, and that's, I stopped doing the accent after that. Uh, you're saying that the status quo denies racism exists while denying the disenfranchised access to privileges they enjoy. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of the major, major things that the Black Panthers pointed out. That's one of the things that Martin Luther King Jr. pointed out with his uh, with the quote that uh, it is the white moderate liberal that we have to watch out for the most. And it's absolutely true because this these white moderate liberals are the ones that are going to come out and be like, oh, I, I don't have a, a racist bone in my body. And you go, well, well, OK, well, don't you want to approve you know, Medicare for all? Don't you think that health care is a human right? The black community is being affected by a, a, the pandemic the most. They're the ones that are suffering. The communities of color uh, are the ones that don't have access to health care because they can't afford it. That's what access means. And they go, no, 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 that's crazy. You can't have that socialism. That'll, you know, that'll destroy America from within. You're absolutely that you're absolutely right, Todd. That's exactly what it is. A uh, couple of uh, thank you for the thank you for the tip on Rockfin, Sarah. I appreciate it. Uh, Bradford, Amy Goodman is a disgrace, as is plutocracy now. <laughs> uh, yes, I I am very disappointed as to what happened to Democracy Now. They used to be one of my go to. Uh, go to news org. I used to listen to them almost every day. And then they went down the Russia gate thing. Um, and uh, I, I basically am very selective about when I want to pay attention to democracy. Now, this was one of the things where I was like, cool, you, you guys actually like covered some real fucking journalism. 
<laughs> That's cool. Good job. Good job, Amy. Way to way to cover some anti-imperialist shit. Um, Sarah, they don't have to. Uh, they cancel and erase you via platforms if you don't prop up the narrative. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they they don't they don't have to kill you anymore. They can just destroy your entire livelihood. Um, that's how they operate now. Uh, and we're and we're and we're seeing that with the attempt to do that with Jimmy Dore. And again, if 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 you're looking at me going, well, Chris, what what the hell are you talking about? This is crazy. Why would you support that? Go and listen to the interview that he did. Uh, with with Magnus, I don't remember the gentleman's last name, uh, but a lot of it are these lefty talking points. He is he is a he is a libertarian anarchist. That's how he describes himself, and I have disagreements with him. I have disagreements with him, and that's okay. But for the most part, I agree with the dude. And these people that are trying to chastise Jimmy Dore for for trying to bridge some gaps, trying to bridge some divides, they're like, "Oh, he's he's a racist and a fascist, and and so on and so forth." And we have to cancel him. And that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what the FBI fe feared, right? Is is people bridging the gap are are the dangerous ones? No, the people bridging the gaps are the ones that we should be helping out, that we should be amplifying, that we should be listening to. That's what's important. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, um, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content you can go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.